katoa ki ngā tangata whenua o tēnei roi, kei te mi, kei te mi, kei te mi, kia koutou. Always a privilege to um, acknowledge the rightful owners of the land, first and foremost. Um, thank you, Khan, Creative Mornings, and you all for turning up on a Friday. You're a better person than I am. Um, <laughs> when I was asked to speak about... Oh, no. no. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> um, I am a daughter of the diaspora. That's my favourite... Um, identifier I've been able to come up with so far. Um, I'm a daughter of labourers and migrants from a variety of homelands but most recently that means Samoa, UK and Canada. Um, I'm also a sister and a partner and um, have recently become a mother to two pretty cool, um, strong-willed, loud children. Um, Api, down the bottom, she is three years old and Lucky is four months old. So. Um, I think it's an act of survival that I am here right now. <laughs> um, I did that thing that we all do, um, well, that I think some of us can admit to doing when you get given a task where you um, Google the definition for a word and then present it as your introduction. So here it is. <laughs> um, and when I saw this, the the thing that stuck out to me was the idea of surviving under adverse or unusual circumstances. And when you put that as a framework onto yourself, it's what is it about you that's adverse or unusual? And the things that I came up with was all that I'm brown, I'm a woman, and I'm a young mum. And actually, it's kind of stink to think of those things as like adversities or unusual circumstances, but actually they're characteristics that I'm super proud of and have totally um, enforce the way that I see things and work and um, do everything. So I'm going to talk about those today, but not under the um, bubble of surviving from them. So this is me uh, as an art baby. Um, I got into art out of luck, actually. I failed third form art. I was miserable at it. We had this um, assignment where we had to draw taxidermy <coughs> ducks and mine clearly weren't very good so I never did art again in school um, and then I got to the point where I was 16 and I had to go to university. Um, it was my parents orders, there was no other way to get through life and up, uh, according to my dad it had to be the University of Auckland so I just kind of hit 17, the beginning of seventh form and was like oh crap what am I going to do there? So I just started looking through things and applying for things and I found that they had this art school. I thought I'd give it a go and I got in. Um, I didn't know at the time that it was Elam School of Fine Art um, but um, my acceptance letter wasn't, hey you got in to art school, it was you got in under UTAS which is the undergraduate targeted admission scheme um, for Māori and other equity groups as they were it. Um, and to get a letter like that when you're 17 is like um, kind of a bit of a mind game because you don't actually know what affirmative action is because to understand affirmative action at 17 you have to understand um, oppression and marginalisation and all of these big things that you don't think about when you're just trying to hang out with your mates. <laughs> um, but um, when I was there the first medium I had to work in was sculpture and actually, high school does not prepare anyone for contemporary sculpture, so we were all um, flailing together. Um, this is a photo that is really um, iconic within the Pacific Arts community. Not this particular one, but this one is a template, and it's a photo that's taken every year on the Tautai Tertiary Art Road Trip. And it's a trip organised by Tautai Contemporary Pacific Arts Trust, which has an awesome programme mandated to support and promote Pacific art and artists and their tertiary program in particular has been really influential <coughs> for me and a few of my mates and um, what they do is they get round up a group of students from Auckland from the various tertiary institutions and you just get chucked on a bus and go to Wellington and look at art and meet new people and talk about things and um, we have what who we call the Tautai bus driver who is a um, pretty great artist in his own right, Selinger David Setonga, and he makes us take this photo. Um, and while I was there, I met um, Louisa Afua, who was studying at AUT at the time, um, and we hung out a bit, she was pretty cool, and 
a year later, we both found ourselves in another um, Tao Tai tertiary program, which was the um, uh, Tao Tai tertiary exhibition. I'm saying tertiary and Tao Tai a lot. I'm getting confused. <laughs> um, but so that's another program, which is um, as a student, it's just so beneficial because you're making work for St Paul Street Gallery, um, a gallery which shows world-renowned artists, and you're there as someone that is an art baby, essentially. Um, and I had finished installing my work for that exhibition, and I was just walking around the room, helping people out, watching other people's, watching and looking at other people's work. And I sat down and watched Louise's work, and it was something that I remember still really vividly to this day. It was. Um, a three channel film um, of her and her siblings talking about their connection to um, Samoan language and Louisa was the oldest out of those three siblings so hers was kind of more in depth I guess and the one that I remember the most is her youngest sister who was just repeating Samoan words that she knew and it was just names of food or objects or swear words but it was just really great and genuine it was the first time I ever had that moment with art where I felt like I had connected to it, that it was made for me by people like me. Um, and it's also the only, the first time that I had this realisation that um, art dies and that that work may be shown again, but it will never be shown again within that time with amongst those other artworks. Um, and so what can we do to capture it? I was, I just re remember realising that art was temporary and that we work for years and years on these things and then they go, like, you know, we do it for a month at a time and what's the point in that? Um, and then I started understanding that actually writing was the way that you can capture those things and so that was the first bit of art I ever wrote about and I published it on a blog that I had then, which I have since tried very hard to erase any trace of from the internet. <laughs> um, but I saw the value of it, both for me as someone who really wanted to capture this work and capture the time of it, but also for the artist to have a record and to have someone um, care enough about the work to really dedicate time and labour to it. Um, and a few months on from that, we set up this website together called Hashtag 500 Words, which was really about um, filling that gap. So at the time, there was only one website that existed to review art. And um, we didn't know why. Why was there only one? Everyone complained that there was only one, but no one was doing anything about it. And so we wanted a space that was for us, um, for us, for our friends, for the way that we thought that really um, challenged whose voices matter and um, what art matters. Um, I guess essentially challenging value systems. And so. <coughs> Um, we set it up in 2012, which was about the time when hashtags were um, a thing. <laughs> um, hence the name, hashtag 500 words. And we um, wanted short, short form. So we set everything to have a word limit of 500 words, um, which was a great challenge. We um, made all sorts of silly decisions, like um, not editing because we thought that um, that was too uh, informative of the opinions that were happening, um, which is quite funny now. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's just quite embarrassing a little bit. But um, it was really for people, like it just was a space for people, for reckons, for think pieces, for gung-ho, quick takes. Um, and we really treated it as an artist-run space that was experimental and um, for everyone. Um, looking back on the site to do this presentation, I totally forgot that we did this column with Natasha Matila-Smith and it's, I think, something I'm still actually really proud of. We spoke with Natasha um, in the lead up to um, Hashtag and what she might want to write for us and she had all these really great ideas and was at the stage where she wanted to narrow it down and we sort of said, nah, you can do everything as a column, let's just think of a good name. And so the name that we came up with was Natasha Matila Smith on Dicks. Um, <laughs> because we felt like it could encompass everything. It could encompass um, talking about biases and value systems within art uh, and the, the dicks that um, are in control of those. It could talk about like um, gender things. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> this is only a, a small selection. It went on for quite a while. It was a monthly column. Um, but around this time, I became a mum to um, Abby. And so my lens, um, not changed, but it widened, I guess. I wasn't just sort of looking through the world as, as this young Pacific person, but I was also a mum. And um, that gave me a real big um, vendetta, I think. I just wanted to defy all the stereotypes and no one was gonna um, <laughs> pigeonhole me down. Um, it's actually kind of um, to my detriment, really. But um, so what I just started doing everything. I started um, making more work and um, curating and, and writing more for various sites and publications, both in um, Aotearoa and Australia. And one of them was Pentagraph Punch. And this is what I learned what editing was. <laughs> um, I had this great editor um, who's a senior editor for the site, Joe Nunwick, and um, he had this really great balance of um, nurturing but also antagonising me. And in a writing process, that's exactly what you need. You need someone who is going to sort of fight, advocate for the, the other side. And really push you and um, the way that you think to the point where you know that you're not just saying something because you've said it, but you really, really say it because you believe it. And when you're writing art criticism, when you're putting yourself out there, when you're throwing out these kind of big ideas, that's exactly what you need. You need someone that is just as invested in that piece as you are, um, because at the end of the day, they have your back because if you're going down, so are they. Um, and then I wrote, I wrote this piece um, up until now, up until this time, um, I had never written about or included anything to do with being a mum because I really did see it as a weakness. And then I was, I had just spent quite a bit of time away. I had spent the month of February um, on a research trip in China, missed my daughter's second birthday, came back for the month of March and then had gone again in the month of April. And for parents in the room, you'll know that that sense of like guilt and anxiety you have when you are not with them all the time, um, that's kind of self-imposed. But um, so I was sitting on the subway in Taiwan and I was messaging a mate of mine and I was like, hey, I think what I do is really radical. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, because I'm like unapologetically a mum, but I'm also unapologetically working in the arts. And I think those two can work together, but I'm not really sure how, but why is it radical in the 21st century, but it is. And so we sort of like went into the spiral and then I went back and wrote this piece, I think in less than an hour. And it was just, um, I didn't realize that it was building up inside of me for that long. And then um, I saw the comments that came through and I realized that actually what we want as readers is to see ourselves reflected back at us. We want people who we can connect with. We want people whose stories we understand and we want people who admit to being human. And so I found that as a real strength. Um, but while I was in Taiwan, that was actually one of the last pieces I wrote and I just decided that I didn't want to write anymore and I was there for an artist residency and I was gonna make art, but my art is like actually publishing because it's a combination of writing and design. So what the hell is my art in an art gallery? And then I was working on this curatorial project, but curation is a lot of admin and like, do I really want to do that? Um, and so I was just in a bit of an identity crisis. Um, and I just didn't know which one of those things I wanted to dedicate my time for. And I'm not interested in being a triple threat. I thought that was really boring. I just wanted to really dedicate myself to one thing. Um, and so, at this stage, I had given up writing, never to write a review again. And then I saw Johnson Wetehira's show Half Blood at Object Space. And I had that really strong desire again that I had with um, Louisa's show to write about art and to capture art and to capture those ideas because it was really great. The show was really great. And I was like, what is going to happen to the show once it dies? <laughs> and like, I can change that. I can keep it alive. Um, so. That's what I did, and not long after that, I got brought on to the team at Pantograph Punch as a visual arts co-editor with the amazing Francis McWannell, who is a, a genius art thinker and writer. 
Um, and it was really great. I think actually what I had been craving was to do the, the work that I had set out to with Hashtag, but with a bigger team, with more of a purpose and with something more stable. So we ended Hashtag um, around the same time. And me and Louisa just really strongly thought that we were getting a bit too old and a bit too cautious. And that that space of, of reckons and, and hot takes needed to be given to another group of, of younger, or that space needed to be kept open for another group of younger people who have not identified themselves yet to um, just keep that going, because it's so needed as well. Um, yeah. Um, so at Pentagraph Punch, I think the, well, in editing, it's such a, it's like quite a strange job that I didn't really know anything about until someone called me one. But <laughs> I think it's really about having the ability to change something in a really tangible way. And with um, writing and art making and curating, I feel that you're always trying to do that, but you're within the constraints of the institutions that you're working for. So. Um, you can only push so much with a piece of writing because you're sitting within a wider platform and like is that wider platform actually changing or inclusive or or any of these questions or is that is that institution actually caring about these things that you're talking about or are you just that a little bit of equitable representation for the year whereas with editing I feel like I could have a literal hand in shaping that and I think it comes back again to wanting to see ourselves reflected I know that people have said that we're beyond that, but I don't think we are. I think we still need our stories and our perspectives and our worldviews, um, not even made space for, but um, embedded within these platforms. And that's something that I'm really about, excited about working with Pantograph Punch and <clears throat> nerdy editor things that I get to play around with is editing out the word New Zealand for um, Aotearoa <coughs> and like do you really think about the wider implications that sit with those things because it's not just a different name it's a different history it's a completely different worldview <coughs> you're it, you know it's, it's just so much bigger than that and if we keep saying New Zealand is the normal then that kind of keeps pushing the word Aotearoa and therefore every massive um, socio-political um, repercussion of that to the periphery and then the other thing that I found real radical the first time I did it was identify an artist as Pakia. But why? Why is that so cutting edge? Because everyone always loves to put um, Samoa next to me. And that's fine, I'm proud of it. But, you know, why is it that one is seen as normal and the other one we have to identify as, as something else? So I don't know if anyone ever notices these things, but when I do them, when I'm sitting behind my MacBook and I'm changing these things in a really nerdy fashion, I feel really um, good about it. And this is one piece that I am really proud to have been a small part of. So our editor-in-chief, Janet McAllister, noticed that um, we on the site were using intersectionality a lot, but also like we as a collective whole were using this term a lot and so she suggested um, having an intersectionality series which um, crossed all the various platforms that Pantograph covers so um, art, theatre, literature and then one that sort of looks at this idea in journalism as a whole and I facilitated the art one and, and invited um, Indigenous curators Nigel Borau, Emma Tavola and Joanna Gordon-Smith to really um, break down what this term meant and my first question I had worked on for like maybe a month and it was like something to do with how as Tohi we allies we can um, enable intersectional thinking something like that I thought was really great and profound and the first answer was from everyone was I don't like that term that term doesn't speak to us it's not an indigenous term it doesn't have anything to do with the way that we think it's something that people thrust upon us um, and I thought that was really great to be able to provide this space for people and then totally get shut down <laughs> in it, but to let them come through. Um, and we actually, all four of us left that room feeling incredibly empowered by the conversation. And so while I think it turned out a really great piece of writing, the implications of that conversation were so much wider and had, I think, a more profound um, impacts on us 
as individuals and to be able to be a conduit for those kind of conversations is really exciting to be able to say to someone hey the way you think is really cool let's set aside two hours of all of our day to come together to really think about these things because we just don't really have time um, so with all of these things that I think about that I've just shared with you in a really haphazard way um, to come back to the word survival I found this other definition which talks about a thing or custom or observance that survives and so the thing that I think that I think I'm trying to help survive are these um, indigenous female people of color worldviews lenses and perspectives and so then when I think about what the unusual or adverse circumstances that I'm surviving from I think that it's actually Dominance. <laughs> cool, thanks.